Welcome to Behind the Bytecode. I'm your host, Shafu, and Behind the Bytecode is a podcast about more philosophical kind of topics, um, what I would call layer zero, so things like social consensus, uh, crypto philosophy, basically all the things that make the bytecode possible in the first place. Um, today's uh, episode is about uh, Karl Popper and David Deutsch, uh, mainly about De Deutsch's thoughts as outlined by him in his two books, uh, The Beginning of Infinity and The Fabric of Reality. And uh, what we're going to try today is connect his thoughts with, uh, with crypto, right, and how they, uh, how they relate with each other. Um, for, for that, I have, a, I have a really great group of guys on today. Uh, we are not only really passionate about crypto, uh, but uh, what's really exciting to me is we're also really passionate about David Deutsch. Um, so yeah, a uh, brief introduction. We have Sam from uh, Superfluid. Uh, Sam, thanks for taking time. Yeah, I'm gonna be here. We awesome. We have Maxime from Sabier. Uh, Maxime, what's up? Hey there. You can call me Max, by the way. Awesome. Okay, Max. Uh, and we have Paul from Sabler as well. Paul, how are you doing, sir? Hey, hey. Uh, doing very well. And you know, thanks for, for uh, hosting us. For sure. Um, so it, I had a really hard time thinking about how I'm going to structure this because uh, obviously uh, David Deutsch's books are super dense. Uh, a lot of uh, ideas and all of them are really important. Um, but let's try this. Um, Sam, if you, if you could summarize the main uh, important ideas for you personally uh, out of uh, David Deutsch. So it's quite difficult to summarize David Deutsch's work in just like a couple of minutes even. Um, I'd say for people listening, the, the two books, just to highlight them, that he's written are The Beginning of Infinity and The Fabric of Reality. Right. So in those books, he lays out in the fabric of reality, he lays out a kind of really fascinating worldview around what he calls the four strands, right, where he goes through the theory of computation, quantum mechanics, epistemology, and the theory of evolution is like defined by uh, Richard Dawkins. So, so neo Darwinism. Um, and then in the beginning of infinity, at least my take on the book is that he a lot, he goes far deeper into epistemology than he does in the fabric of reality. And for me personally, all the most interesting ideas, at least for me, and this kind of connects to Karl Popper, are the epistemology bits, right? So there are, are topics we're going to discuss today that have been very impactful to me, like this, this concept of, uh, you know, every single problem being soluble, as long as that, that solution does not defy the laws of physics, right? That might be one thing we discuss. But the big ones are just around how to actually view science in a practical way, right? So all the things you grew up learning about how the scientific method works, uh, all these things where maybe you're in university, you're talking about p-values and you, you get into Bayesianism and statistics. Deutsch kind of, uh, you know, really refutes a lot of that thinking and presents science and the scientific method uh, in a way that, I think it's far more practical for people in, in their lives, right? And I think it's, it's very, all, all of the things that he discusses are very applicable to what we're doing in crypto because we're trying to build new things, right? Every new protocol is a conjecture about a new system, right? Uh, and there are all kinds of uh, things that we have in crypto, in DeFi in particular, uh, that, that help us criticize these systems, whether it's hacks, audits, uh, other things going wrong. So for me, his books and his thinking have given me a, a really powerful uh, worldview, I guess, to explain what's actually happening in the world around us um, and, you know, be more useful in our industry. But guys, what would you add to that? Paul, Max, Jeff, what would you, what would you add to my, my summarization? Um, I'd say that, that was a great summary um, and a great starting point. Um, uh, my background with um, you know Deutsch and Popper is that I I, I started with the beginning of Infinity um, three years ago. Um, then I continued with the Fabric of Reality, and I agree with you that 
Um, by the way, should we short uh, sh- use the shorthands BOI and uh, FORR because they will probably be used a lot on this uh, in the podcast. So um, I'm going to say I, I read BOI in 2020 and then I continued with uh, FOR in uh, like the next year. And um, I agree that, that, that the fabric of reality was more um, rooted in physics. He focused more on, you know, the uh, many universes aspects of quantum theory, um, which were not, and they continue to not be taken seriously. Whereas uh, uh, BOI is more uh, focused on the um, the place of humans in, in in reality, right? Like why we are important, and why knowledge is key to understanding the world. And you know, he gives that great example with. Um, the champagne cork in um, in the uh, uh, you know the scientists' labs. You cannot explain the behavior of that champagne um, unless you uh, uh, can uh, you know explain astrophysics. And um, you know over over time, it took me a while to understand to grapple with all those ideas. But over time, the way uh, it like this worldview has helped me is just help me correct my errors more quickly um uh, as you guys are you know developers and like you know working in crypto um we make we build new products and you know making new things will necessarily involve a lot of errors at the beginning and um for me at least you know deutsch's worldview has just helped me first understand that i will always make errors and uh the point is just to make them more quickly and correct them and uh, yeah, it was super practical philosophy, and you know that's why I uh, I immediately said yes to this you know podcast is because this I I just love like learning about this and sharing these ideas and I think in the current context that we find ourselves with ChatGPT and you know AI, uh, these ideas are even more topical than ever because uh, the world is mired in misconceptions about the future of knowledge and yeah that that's my take. Yeah, I think um, Deutsch's work is tremendously optimistic, um, and it's and it really shows how optimism is is true in a sense, and how um, pessimism pessimism is just in, inherently wrong. Um, and I think, I mean, Deutsch's work is so um, covers so many topics that you can't really summarize the books. You have to really just read them. Um, but uh, I, I, you know, aside from all the topics which were mentioned here, which are in, indeed incredibly interesting, uh, I think what 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 I found the most interesting was uh, I think it's, it's at the end of uh, the beginning of Infinity. Uh, it's a chapter around beauty and how there is actual objective beauty. Um, you, you know, if you, if you if you take a piece of uh, Mozart um, and you change just a single note, it will just sound wrong, right? It, it, there, something will feel off. Um, and which is just proof that there is there is actual objective beauty, and that we can create more beautiful things, uh, and that it's not just subjective. Um, and I think these types of things, which um, correct misconceptions, as Paul said, uh, you, you will find plenty of them in in, in his books. Um, and it's about addressing all these biases, all these misconceptions we have about the world like the uh, spaceship Earth metaphor, for example, um, which are wrong, which usually a lot of people take for granted and as common sense, um, and which aren't, which are just wrong. Yeah. Yeah. To, so to me personally, for me, the main takeaway is, uh, as Paul said, uh, error correction, right? And to make that more specific, um, we all moved, this is very specific, we all moved from hard hat uh, to foundry, right? And why did we do that? Um, it's really hard to put into words, but a great summary would be because you can fail quicker, right? Um, and this allows this iteration loop to be quicker, and so you can improve and move into the right direction. Um, so yeah, error correction. The other thing is um, about error correction, uh, where I really have a hard time, in, in smart contracts especially, um, is uh, immutability, right? Because on one hand, 
um, you know, crypto values, uh, 21 million, all of this stuff is about something that doesn't change, right? And uh, me as a smart contract developer on a stable coin right now, we really we are really trying hard to build something that isn't going to change, right? That's unruggable, basically. But on the other side, um, something immutable, uh, you cannot improve that anymore. Right, which is which are which is a really really big downside. So I wondered how how you guys are thinking about something like that. Uh, speaking of founder, um, just to quickly um, comment on that. I mean, that's absolutely right. I mean, it's the idea is that you can like run your tests more quickly, like like one hundred x more quickly, and you know what do you write tests for to fix the bugs in the production code. So, you know, it, it, it's literally the best example for like, you know, crypto devs, uh, uh, you know, you like 100 texts, uh, uh, like more, uh, you know, quicker, like uh, a test, like test runs, uh, you, you correct your production code <laughs> more quickly. Um, speaking of stable coins and like immutability in general, well, I'm, I'm not a stable coin expert. Um, I'm not like in even like economics, you know, medium uh, expert. I, I, I just know the basics, but what I, what I, what I do understand is, I mean, there is certain like attention with, you know, stable assets in crypto, um, due to the reasons that you said, and like the way I think about stable coins is that there's always someone responsibility behind that. Uh, this is what the government does, right? I mean, even if you forget about crypto for, for a bit, um, you know, the stability of like fiat is, is, is not for free. Like the government is paying for that. And I mean, by proxy, you're paying for that uh, if you're paying taxes, of course. Um, and and therefore, um, you know, there is no such thing as like true stability in the long term. Uh, mm -hmm. Things are always volatile. It's just that somebody is, um, you know, taking a risk for you uh, in, in in the short term, the medium term. And, uh, I mean, I mean, it, it, it does create society, right? Like it, it's, it's good that we have certain assets that provide some sort of like peace of mind to people. I just wanted to flag that, you know, if, if, if you're going to go really deep philosophically, there's nothing stable. It's just like, uh, you know, an economic term we, we use to, you know, build society. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, maybe to, that would be helpful to like set the stage is like, what maybe explain why we're talking about error correction so much and what we mean. So. In the fabric of reality, I think it's the fabric of reality, Deutsch basically lays out, I think, it's, I think it's a chapter on problem solving, where he basically lays out like how knowledge grows, right? And it's, it's somewhat different than I think what most people are conditioned to believe if they just like read the headlines about new scientific studies and are trying to understand them in the context that like the mainstream media would try to explain them. And the way that Deutsch lays out how, how knowledge grows is they, it, it basically always starts with a conjecture, right? And I, some explanation about uh, why X is a certain way that is hard to vary while still purport, like actually explaining what it purports to explain, right? And we can talk more about ex explanations and hard to vary if we need to, but that's how it starts, right? Then it is exposed to criticism. And then, you know, criticism is probably going to poke holes in whatever it is. And it's probably going to poke holes in whatever the initial theory was, the initial conjecture was before you even run any kind of experiment in the first place. All of us are doing this all the time. We're, we're coming up with ideas and most of the ideas we have, before we even implement them or try to implement them in the world, we shoot them down on our own head via this process in our own minds, right? When it comes to what you just mentioned about immutability, there actually is a tension here. Um, Maybe not like on an industry wide scale, if you really zoom out, right? If you really zoom out and think very long term, if someone wants to build an immutable protocol and like they feel super strongly about deploying this immutable, immutable stable coin protocol that's going to have some kind of algorithmic process to do this, well, like, you know, it could fail, it could get hacked, or the whole system could fail, and the entire industry could decide to create a new conjecture and build a different system and make that immutable, right? And we just, you know, progress kind of like evolution progresses relatively slowly, a biological evolution that is, yeah. relatively slowly, 
you know, as each uh, project kind of dies or runs out of money uh, and we push this forward. So that would eventually probably happen. I think the tension though is, you know, with all software, it's, it's all fallible, right? We all, we all know that like we write software and there's probably something wrong with it, right? So to say, to have the, the confidence or the, the gumption to say, you know, I'm going to deploy this one protocol and it's going to be good for forever because of X, Y, and Z reason, that's not really epistemolo epistemologically sound according to Deutsch, right? So this is something that we all do need to wrestle with. Um, and honestly, in, in your guys' case, I'm curious, like, Paul, like, how do you, how do you think about this? As someone who's like, Sabler has been around for a while. Like, you've had a lot of, there's been a lot of time. It's, it's kind of one of the more Lindy projects, right? You've had a lot of time, a lot of exposure to the, to the market. Um, I mean, how do you see this tension between immutability and the fact that we're all fallible and write bad software? Right. So how do you see that? <laughs> Lots of in, like good, good threads to go um, from here. Um, I just want to correct one error. <laughs> I think good. that you just made some. Uh, I, I, I think like Deutsch is a, a, a point is that like all knowledge starts with a problem. Mm. So a conjecture comes only after you have a problem and then you propose that conjecture to solve the problem. Correct. Uh, don't, don't quote me on this. It's just like my volleyball you are correct, um, right? interpretation. <laughs> Great. Um, in, in, in terms of like um, immutability and like contracts um, and like savior. Yeah. Um, for context for like um, listeners, um, we first shipped savior v1 in 2019. And um, we are um, glad that we have never been hacked. Um, you know, it was a simple protocol, um, a, a, like a simple single contract protocol, but still, uh, we, uh, we are fortunate enough that funds were never lost. Um, now, you know, in the meantime, we started working on a new version and we will also be, I mean, we are also exposed to the same problem of like, how do we, um, you know, push new features? How do we like innovate while at the same time, um, you know, like taking care of immutability, like not, uh, we don't like having upgradable contracts for sure. Um, and I guess, you know, like if, if, if you think about the long term, like the really the long term again, um, what we are building now with smart contracts is just, you know, temporary software that will solve a problem in the short term. And then something else will come along in five, 10 years. Uh, or even you know shorter than that, and then we will have to re-implement our systems using that new paradigm. Um, the benefit of immutability um, is 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 that it, it it gives you that like short-term you know benefit of like you know there's nothing we can do about it, and it solves these centralization problems and you know just scales up the software it like makes it global. But I don't think for one second and I think I tweeted about this like few months ago, I don't think even the UV app will be around in 10 years. Um, that, that's like a bold statement for somebody who, you know, my life's work is attached to the EVM. Um, but I think my, my take on this is that, you know, I'm, we're just having fun. We're like building stuff. Uh, we think we're solving problems. We have to build them and like ship them to see if they will solve problems. It's just that I'm trying like not to cling too hard to, um, you know, the fact that, yeah, it's, it's mutable. Therefore it will forever be successful. I mean, that will that will forever uh, uh, have users because of that, and uh, because the underlying attack will somehow magically remain forever untouched, uh, 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 unlike anything else in the universe. Um, yeah, sort of the long rambling answer, um, but I guess that that's my take. Yeah, and I think um, a lot of a lot of what smart contract building is about is about creating these simple contracts. Um, removing as much as possible from them as you can, uh, you know, whatever can be done outside of the contracts, outside of uh, the port call should be done outside of the port call, uh, precisely because of, you know, immutability and because of it's, it's just hard to fix things when it's already on the blockchain. Um, and that's also why, for example, we've been seeing this rise of, of programming languages like Rust, for example, where the whole focus is precisely on error correction uh, directly from the start, right? So when you start building in Rust, directly from the, the get-go, when you compile, the compiler will be very, very strict and will raise a lot of 
bugs and errors it, it's able to to find in your code. Um, and I think that's the right path. Uh, you know, you, you could see languages like Rust as a, kind of like a popperian in a sense uh, because they so they focus so much on on error correction. Um, and I wanted to come back to something which Sam said earlier, which is that uh, in crypto, the markets, and actually the market in general, but especially in crypto, is a giant uh, conjecture refutation machine, basically. So anyone is able to conjecture something uh, even, even more easily than in the normal economy, uh, because you can just set up a DAO in like a few clicks, um, launch your ID, and then the market will criticize it. If you have users, if if your token goes up or whatever, uh, you know you may be on something. If not, if you get hacked, if no one is using your product, well, there there you have it. You have your reputation, um, and so you can see capitalism and specifically crypto because crypto is really like free markets all the way um, as a sort of like gigantic conjecture reputation machine for progress, uh, which is. I think really awesome. Yeah, I think. Yeah, it, 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 oh, Sam, go ahead. Go ahead. No, I was just going to say, I think you're spot on with that. And if you look at crypto and compare it to something like traditional finance, the speed at which this process can happen in crypto is so much faster. And mm -hmm. while DeFi looks tiny, and it is tiny compared to traditional finance now. The speed at which these systems are going to be able to evolve because they've been set up in this very open way, right? there's really been no intentional setup. They've just been allowed to exist uh, outside of this system where anyone anywhere in the world can come up with a conjecture, right? They can try to solve a problem that they had, whether they're, they're an anon that lives in South America or they live in the epicenter of technology in one of the major uh, cities in the Northern Hemisphere, right? So I, I think it's... It's really worth highlighting that because it's a big feature of, I think, what we're what we're working on. Yeah, we, we are sprinting through financial history, right? It really feels that way. Uh, and sometimes it feels, uh, you know, it doesn't, it, it isn't perfect, but it shouldn't be, right? So sometimes it feels like re, we, re, we are reinventing the wheel. Uh, sometimes it feels like we are re reinventing the stock company, right? Where you see governance and stuff and you're basically saying, Hey, wait a minute. This is a stock company without equity rights, right? Uh, which you, which you often get. Um, but yeah, we have error correction on our side and that's why we are all so bullish on this, right? Because we are, we believe basically that that's the only, uh, the only process that we are, that we know of so far, uh, to make process, uh, to make progress. Um, I don't think it's yeah. a, uh, a, a, a coincidence that streaming is being developed in crypto. Um, you know, I, I don't have any data to prove this, but I'm, I'm sure as hell that, you know, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, there was some guy in, in a bank who, who said, let's build by the second payments. And some guy in a suit above him told him, you know, fuck off, like, I'm not gonna do it because, because the infrastructure is like too hard to build. Or, you know, people won't want this or whatever. And here you are, you have, you know, two companies on, on this, just on this call. Yeah. You have like multiple, uh, there's like an explosion of like streaming companies, right? Like, like nowadays, um, especially for like vesting tokens. Um, and, you know, we can do this because we didn't have, we didn't have to like ask for permission. We just like built it from our, you know, laptops at home. Um, and that's exciting because, you know, we are putting forth a new money Lego that didn't exist before and we can rapidly innovate it and in, you know, so on and so forth. I just want to quickly go back to one of like Ma uh, uh, Max's points about like rust, uh, and, and like popper. I think I, I had a tweet about this. Um, but I said that rust is what popper would have developed if he turned to software engineering. <laughs> um, because I mean, if, if, I, I wrote Rust code for um for a bit. I, I, I published this tool on GitHub. And you know, I'm I'm not an expert by any means, but y y you only have to spend a little bit of time in Rust to realize that um it takes a hell of a lot of time just to make it compile. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that is is that it literally throws errors at you. And it, it 
it's like like having a mini popper next to you saying, <laughs> correct it, correct it, you know, like, here's an error for you, throw it, like, handle it. And, you know, it's it, it, it's a really nice paradigm, and um, I'm glad, by the way, to see new programming languages like Sway, um, which combine the best of both worlds, where you can have, you know, like, the, the, uh, uh, the, the solid, uh, like, ironically, the solid build of, like, Rust with Solidity, which has the contract API, um, but you know. Yeah, I was gonna bring up Sway as well, because it's another good example of people taking old ideas, right? And, and trying to build new useful things in, in our space and to being able to do it relatively, relatively quickly, right? I mean, we're already talking about building the systems we've, we've been building in new programming languages and on new virtual machines, like Fuel's working on a lot of different things in, in this regard as well. and. In traditional finance, they're still buying mainframes, and things run on COBOL servers, right? So, I mean, it, it, there's, there's a difference. There. <laughs> yeah. Yes, they definitely do. Uh, Maxim, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I wanted to come back to um, your your analogy, Sam, about the the market. Like, it, it's it's so crazy that the stock market is so inefficient when you think about it. Like, it's only open to certain people. Uh, it's only open for certain hours every day. It's not even open during the weekend. Um, and then you have crypto, which is just this completely open system which anyone can access anywhere in the world whenever you want. Um, and it's just a much better error correction mechanism. Like, you know, if you have like an arbitrage opportunity, for example, which is an inefficiency in the economy, uh, which is an error, um, it will be fixed much more rapidly, simply because anyone can can, can fix it, not just uh, people who have, you know, a war in America or, you know, US citizens or, or whatever. Um, so, yeah, crypto is the ultimate air correction mechanism for finance in, in that regard, I think. There's also like a, a, a question of, uh, or like a benefit of providing cheap global public goods, because you have an like evolutionary process that, filters out the hacked protocols, right? Like, you know, those that get hacked and continue to get hacked over time will simply like, can, you know, continue to lose users. I mean, I, I don't want to name names, but there, you know, everybody knows certain protocols that just kept being hacked over time, especially for like lending and, you know, that kind of like financial, uh, super financial uh, use cases. And the benefit of the public of like the layman is that you have the, you know, publicly certifiable uh, proof that this system has functioned for like 24 seven for like five years. Nobody managed to hack into it. You simply cannot have that kind of guarantee with a bank as recent events have shown us, even the greatest and, you know, um, uh, you know, a Silicon Valley bank, right? Like failed, right? So it, it, it's like a different kind of, um, evolutionary process that happens in crypto that you just simply cannot replicate with TradFi. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, let's talk about the EVM, guys, because you, Paul, just said something really <laughs> interesting because you said uh, you probably think, and again, right, uh, impossible to predict the growth of future knowledge. So. Uh, take this with a grain of salt, but basically you said in 10 years, you don't think there will be the EVM or basically it's, it's maybe it's something totally else, or it just changed so much that we wouldn't call it the EVM anymore. And I actually disagree here a little bit because, uh, of, of, uh, universality, right? Which is also a big theme, uh, in, uh, in David Deutsch's books, um, where I think that the EVM is Turing complete, right? It's universal or uh, Turing complete, at least in the theoretical, not really in the theoretical kind of sense, because you don't have infinite uh, storage, but let's say, let's say for the sake of argument, it is that through universality and network effects that it's good enough, right? That it's, it's the same story and again, impossible to predict the future through the past, but it's similar to the JavaScript uh, story, right? Where we had the thing, it was universal, it was good enough. Uh, we optimized the shit out of, out, out of the VM, 
right? And uh, we built on it. And through something like layer two or layer three or whatever comes ahead, you have the ability basically to escape the EVM uh, on higher levels. But on the bottom, it's still the EVM because of network effects, because of Lindy, because of security tools, and so on and so forth. So uh, what do you think about that? As I said, I, I could be completely wrong. Um, it, it's just that, you know, it's an educated bet that I made publicly and I continue to make um, based on my hands-on experience building on EVM. I think I think we had an exchange about this on Twitter. When I tweeted this, you, you replied with exactly what you said now. I, I think, could be wrong, but I, th I think you said that, yeah, I mean, JavaScript, you know, is ubiquitous today, even if there's like various better alternatives. And uh, let me just restate what I said on Twitter, which, which I still um, hold those those views. Um, first of all, I think the fact that JavaScript is ubiquitous today is is, is a, a mistake. Um, I think it shouldn't have been. There are so many, like so many people lost money, time, and so forth because somebody didn't use the correct types in the back end, right? Like null or whatever. Uh, and, and, and like with, with, with TypeScript at least, like they're like better um, alternatives, but with like TypeScript, you at least like get that, you know, typing system on top. And um, so that's like one thing. The other thing is that I think JavaScript was originally developed in, in an environment where technology was like less flexible and less adaptable. Um, you know, like JavaScript was basically developed at the same time with the hardware that we're using to record this podcast. Um, and people were just buying them for the first time and they were just using them for the first time and so on. So there was like limited bandwidth for newcomers to, and like developers to say, I'm going to use this and then I'm, I'm going to switch. It was like that, you know, Cameron explosion of like, let's build the first ever internet companies. Now we are in an era where with past that time, like we have the internet wires, you know, and like we have the internet set up properly. And I think we are m much better suited as like a society to say, you know, we can swap out software, like we can replace software. Um, yes, there will be some path dependence, like in certain cases, like may maybe ERC20 will stay forever. I don't know. It like within the EVM. But I don't see any reason why entire new platforms cannot be developed in parallel and eventually got, like garner more users than the EVM. Um, in, in like to, to expand on that from like a hands-on developer perspective, right? Like you can throw in any, like as many um, like layer twos and like modular blockchain, um, quasi-modular blockchain uh, architectures that will boost the EVM till, I don't know, millions of transactions per second. Um, that will not solve the problem of account extraction, which uh, on Ethereum is a pain in the neck because, um, for example, you, you have a token, you have to approve it, and then you have to transfer it. Like, you, you can't do those two separate transactions like with one Ethereum, like with one user signature. And I have hands-on experience with this because I built this proxy contract called PRP proxy, which um, if you're familiar with DS proxy from Maker, it's, it's, it's super similar, but I just, you, you know, developed it using the latest um, Solidity version 0 0.8. And I wish I didn't have to build that. I, I, I wish I didn't have to put in the work to, uh, to, you know, think about it, design it, test it with Foundry and so on and so forth, because it's a liability. I, I wish the, core protocol provided me with tools to, you know, to, to do that. And, you know, uh, like, again, that's one issue, which will never be patched by multiple millions of transactions per second. It's something that is about the um, uh, qualitative aspect of the uh, virtual machine. Yeah, a lot of really good points there. I would also say that Back to the topic of error correction, over time, these things kind of calcify and become much harder to change, especially when they have more users. I mean, it's very difficult. Go talk to anyone that's ever tried to, to get an EIP implemented, implemented into the EVM. 
within the last like one or two years, right? It, it's very, very challenging, right? It's, it's a very political process because it kind of has to be, right? This is a very important system that a lot of people have a very large stake in, right? And uh, yeah, it, you know, for example, you know, it comes back from the fuel ecosystem, right? We, we brought up Sway. If you go to the fuel book, they have a whole section on EIPs that didn't get implemented, implemented in the EVM that they've been able to put into the fuel VM because they've been able to start from scratch, right? There is some benefit to that. Um, I don't think the EVM will go away in 10 years necessarily, uh, but I, I definitely am not, I'm not willing to bet uh, a large amount on it being the only player or the, even the primary player anymore, just because we don't, we don't, we just don't know. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, I think we shouldn't underestimate the fact the network effects of the EVM. I mean, we are we're seeing it with Twitter right now, where uh, every few weeks or months you get a new wave of people saying that they will leave Twitter for the newest alternative, whether it's uh, Nostra, I think it's called Mastodon, Forecaster, uh, and now Blue Sky, uh, and yet they are still on Twitter. Um, so the the network effects are very 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 hard to. Uh, to, to fight against, um, and the EVM has very strong network effects. It has all the venture capital funding, all the developers, uh, all the users right now, uh, and so all that learning curve uh, needs to be uh, like, like that. Learning curve will be even bigger for like new projects uh, trying to compete with EVM. Um, it's already big for the EVM. You know, if, as a new user when you join, you know, just like using MetaMask or that kind of stuff, it's, it's already confusing. Um, but if you want to use another uh, blockchain like Cosmos, for example, then you have to relearn everything from scratch. It's 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 complicated. It's it's really complicated. Um, and I think all the um, the efforts right now in scaling are around um, you know circumventing these limitations, as uh, as you said, Shafu, uh, with you know the zero knowledge rollups, uh, fuel, for example, uh, which is kind of EVM based. Uh, they I mean they built their own uh, version of the EVM, I guess. Um, and you know these are all efforts to circumvent. Uh, but I, I'm yeah, I, I, I'm not sure we will be able to, um, to to live without the EVM in ten years. Uh, I think it will probably be a variant, or at least you know somewhat based on the EVM as we know it today, uh, simply because network effects. It's just too hard to, to change. No, some some really good points there. And and let me get back to the computational universality again. Um, I think Vitalik Genius was in uh, when he, I don't know, I don't even know uh, what the name of the project was, but it was basically here are like 21 different contracts that you can deploy on our blockchain, uh, like they're trying to define the DeFi building blocks. And Vitalik was, and this is the main idea, right, of the whole thing. Vitalik was, hey, let's do this, but let's do it in a computational universal way, right? Where you can- It was colored coins. Sorry to interrupt you, it was colored coins. Colored coins, that's project. right, that's right, that's right. And that's a, you know, that's a qualitative difference. That's the jump to universality there, where this is qualita uh, qualitatively something different. And that's why Ethereum won. Now you are competing on a different level. And, and who knows, maybe there is another like quantum computation universality that we are still not aware of, but that, that's my main argument that, okay, we have this universality there. It is good enough. You can build on that. You don't have to do something from scratch anymore. I think that's, that's the, my, my main point, I think. Uh, Paul, you're muted. Can you hear me now? Okay, great. Um, so I, I was saying that I, I, I agree with that, um, that we crossed the line to like universal smart contracts already. And all of these new designs like fuel are not introducing like a new category of like computation. They're just like building upon an existing category. Um, however, I, 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 I come back to my point of, 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 of like the issues of the EVM. Um, you know, as like Sam said, you know, just go to fuel docs. There's like 20 AIPs that like never got implemented in EVM. And those are like super important, like EIPs, like making transactions parallelizable. 
Um, and I, 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 I want to comment on like what Max said about the network effects. That it, it is true that you know EVM has the most users today, but you know, it, it, like the number of users in Web three is a rounding error for the numbers of users on the internet. Um, and I, I, I just wouldn't. Um, you know, make any futures, like long-term guesses based on the traction so far, besides saying that it will exist. So maybe like the way I will revise my bet based on my conversation with you guys is that I, I, I wouldn't say that the EVM will go extinct. Uh, I would say that EVM will just continue to exist. It will be in the background for sure. I just, I'm really skeptical that it will be the first, like, you know, um, uh, number one as it is today. Um, then to continue on your thread with the other kind of possible universality, um, my understanding of like quantum computation is that there's, I mean, it's still computation. It's like nothing different. Actually, classical computation is just like a subset of quantum computation. Um, you basically just average out the universes in a multiverse, right? And you do your, your computations in some certain like sliver. And you can, you can, you know, like get like a, 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 we use classical computation to the principles that like Turing laid out to uh, reason about computation, but the computation at the deepest like layer of reality is quantum. Like everything's quantum, right? We are quantum. Uh, and since we started this conversation, we branched off into like these, you know, infinite not copies of ourselves talking slightly di like different things on this call, right? So if there's something new, like for like smart contracts in particular to discover, I would say that it's, it's likely going to be in the, um, you know, uh, um, uh, processing speed, like somehow make smart contracts instant because, you know, you like, in a way I, I, I call the quantum computer, the perfect, um, um, you know, a parallel computation, you know, machine. There's nothing more perfect than that because you use, you know, uh, you know, uh, uh, quanta like themselves, right? You use particles for that. You don't always you're using like higher level um, abstraction. So I think, it, you know, if my conjecture on this is that if there will be quantum based smart contract systems in, in the future, they will not innovate in the sense that Ethereum did with respect to Bitcoin, but they will just make Ethereum, you know, insert your big number X, uh, more, you know, like faster, cheaper, better, and so forth. No, that's, uh, that's a really fair point, Paul. It's, uh, maybe, maybe, maybe to clarify that again, I think through uh, quantum computation, you at least, uh, open up a new frontier with computations that are, uh, would take like a million years right now which would take five seconds in the quantum se settings. I think that's, that's one point. Uh, but, but maybe to summarize and, and then let's move on to another topic, I think, uh, uh, about the EVM. Uh, I think we're going to look back in 10 years uh, and look at the EVM like we're looking at JavaScript right now. I think uh, I, hopefully it will be different, uh, but I think the trajectory... Uh, could be like that, but who knows, right? And again, we are, uh, we believe in Popper and Deutsch and so on. It's impossible to predict the future growth of knowledge. Uh, so who, who knows, right? Well, that's the thing. We don't believe in them. We criticize their, their arguments and then we now understand the arguments. That's, that's right. That's right. Yeah, I, I, I also use Popper and Deutsch more of like. Uh, a label for a collection of ideas That's more right. than their identities. Like you have to put a label on, like like a like a meme plex, like a like a philosophy, right? You have to put a name on it. You know, these are the gentlemen who built them, but I'm not so much deferring to them as like people. I'm I'm more interested in the uh, algorithm that you run, to, like to you know do your own, um, uh, you know computations like in, in your mind, like criticizing ideas and so forth. And you uh -huh. use Papyrian to, de to describe yeah. that process. So, sorry, uh, no, a hundred percent, a hundred percent. I, I, 
You know, it's, it's as I said, it's a placeholder for the for the exactly. philosophy. And I, I, I actually I actually tried really hard, and I think I, sh I shared that with Sam and, and Max. Uh, I actually tried really hard to 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 coin, you know, this kind of philosophy. And I, I actually the term that I gave it was Popperian complexitism, which I think is probably a really bad name. Uh, but the abbre abbreviation is kind of cool. It would be like a Pop C or something. You know, where I, where I encapsulate this set of ideas uh, in an actual term, because you're completely right. We don't believe in the person, we believe in the ideas. Uh, so yeah, 100%. I, I, and I think it's, it's really sad, right? Now. So for example, if you go to the David Deutsch Wikipedia, right? It should be, it should be like David Deutsch, yeah, physics and so on and so forth, but it should be also like the founder of this philosophy, right? Like Stoicism, for example. But it's missing. Like we need a term for this new optimistic error correction. It's it's a philosophy. It's a worldview, right? Yeah, I think the the name which is currently mostly used is critical rationalism, mm -hmm. um, which yeah, which was an okay name. I think the, the problem with it is that it's uh, people now hear a lot of the rationalist movement with uh, Yudkowsky and AI and stuff, uh, so they may. Uh, mix the two and they are very, very different. Um, so, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. One interesting thing though, like what I was going to say there is, you know, it doesn't matter if it was popper, if, if, if some anon in crypto Twitter comes along with better ideas, we should, you know, if they have better explanations, we should, you know, follow those explanations instead. Right. It's just the best misconception we have in time. Um, but I I'll also say though, like back to the traditional finance versus what we're working on, there's really no credentialism that works in our space, right? Uh, Metallic was a teenager and he built a system that's more lasting with a larger community than, you know, some of these MIT professors that spin up their own blockchain, right? That have all the credibility in the world behind them. So I, I think that that's also worth pointing out. Yeah, no, 100%. Uh, it's all about the ideas, uh, not all about the people. And I think, so for example, Naval, a uh, very famous uh, David Deutsch fan, uh, we call it, or the set of, again, right? I do this mistake a lot, like uh, David Deutsch as a placeholder for this philosophy. And, you know, he had this famous quote for, so for example, if you, if you study economics, you should read Adam Smith's uh or if you read uh if you're physics you should read the original papers by einstein which is completely wrong right it should be it's it's about about the ideas and not who wrote them i personally never never read uh, popper directly i i never did but it's again it's about the set of ideas here so yeah for sure um let me actually uh Let's actually talk about good explanations here, because I, I had an interesting thought here, I think, about mutation testing, right? And about what are good explanations. Good explanations are, you still have the explanation in there, but it's really hard to vary, which is, I think there is a similarity here to mutation testing. Uh, and for the listeners that don't, don't know, mutation testing is basically... So for me, is is a way to show that you have proper testing. You change some things in the code and you see your test should fail and should not pass. So I wonder what you guys, what your guys, maybe do you see something different here or is there like a parallel? Um, I, I have been wanting to write an article about this, um, strategy for writing tests with Foundry um, that we applied in our Saved Review 2 code base. Um, I hope I will be able to make a presentation about this after the launch because I think it's pretty cool. And I, I, I think it's it, it it's similar to what you just said about like um, hard to vary tests, right? The idea is that you want to design your tests in such a way that um, you account for all the possible branches in your function. So, for example, if you have an if, you want to go through you know, that if, and then you want to test the other if. 
But the, the idea is that you want to literally write a test in such a way that when you get to the bottom um, branch, like logical branch, you have like an explicit note that, hey, this test has the state configured in such a way that the if before this final state uh, 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 like line has been you know passed. And with this approach, like being explicit about what is your, what is the context in which that test is run, um, if you, you know, change, um, I'm using modifiers to structure my tests, like, uh, and, and if you change one modifier um, that does something, then you trickle down, like, you have like a, you know, trickle down effect where you break all the other tests. And I think this sort of like, like touches upon your point about like mutation testing where you ha want to have first like an English description of what a test does. And then you want to have an implementation that is super specific to your business application um, such that if, you know, any tiny piece changes, um, then, you know, the test don't run anymore. And I think this is where the analogy with like Deutsch and, you know, Xology comes is that um, you can just swap out that test and it will still pass, right? You you want it to be highly specific. And I will add to this that, like, the way I generally think about exponentials themselves is that, you know, they're like DNA in a way, right? Like, they're, they're like DNA for particular problem situations where, you know, D DNA is like, like knowledge solution for the problem of some particular environment. Whereas um, with exponentials in general, they're like, you know, highly, um, I mean, ex good explanations are like hard to come by. So like people spend a lot of time building and like working them. So it's the same thing with like tests um, in you know, like, for, like for smart contracts. You want them to be super um, well-crafted and, and tailored such that they basically only work for your protocol. If you were to copy paste them and to put it in like any other repo on GitHub, they should not work. Yeah, and I think this notion of hard to vary explanations is also very important when it comes to building smart contracts. So your contracts should obviously be hard to vary. Like every function in your contract uh, should be, uh, like there should be a valid reason why it's like that and not another way, right? Uh, and this, this comes down again to this, this idea of like, you know, it, it should be as simple as possible and it should be hard to vary because the harder to vary it is, the, the least uh, likely it is that you will get hacked or that your protocol will have to be, um, that you will have to release a new version in the future because it's not optimal and that kind of stuff. Um, and so hard, hard to vary explanations are incredibly important when it comes to, to, to building, co building contracts. And I think uh, at, at least in our case, uh, at Sable, our, our method of operating there has always been to be completely open to feedback. Um, so we like, we question everything, uh, and every time there is, you know, a, a, an internal decision, which needs to be made, uh, it's kind of like, uh, a forum, I guess, where, you know, you write a post and then every, er, everyone g gives their, their opinion about it and, um, you, you know, constructive thoughts. And then, you know, you, uh, each, each point which is brought up in the discussion is then either, uh, you know, accepted or, 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 or refuted and. That's how you actually create these hard to vary uh, systems, because you basically uh, find all of the little issues um, in, in your own explanation, your, your own work. For example, if you were the contract, your own contract, uh, you know, your 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 uh, fellow co colleagues help you find these issues, and then you fix them, and then and then that's just how it works. Um, and so, you know, you you could see auditing, for example, uh, you know, if it's a good audit or not just marketing, um, as a way also to, you know, correct these mistakes, uh, and, and create these hard to vary, um, contracts, I guess. That's fascinating to hear you guys talk through your process for that. I think that's, that's brilliant. So thanks for sharing that. I, I, I hope to read the article you put out, Paul, I hope, cause I think that'd be, that'd be useful for myself and other people in the space. So no pressure. <laughs> um, for sure. I mean, I, uh, uh, I, you know, I, I, I like to like, like the reason why I put, for example, like 
educational content on my on, on my Twitter is also to like correct my own errors. I, I learn in that way. You know, like I, I find that isolating certain ideas in like a tweet of like five lines where you have to make it work, otherwise people will complain and say that, you know, it doesn't work. Um just helps with, with like learning in general. Um but like to, to, to follow to, to to follow up on what Max said, I think I've always been you know, I, I, I've been into like startups for a long time and I've been reading YC's articles for, you know, again, like for a long time. And now, I mean, I sort of, I think about them as unaware, like they were papyrus without knowing, um, because, you know, they have this, these articles about, um, go talk to users, like, or like build, go build something like people want. That's basically code name for, you know, go conjecture and like correct your errors. How do you do that? You talk to users because they will tell you what errors you have. Um, they, they, they never put it into like a philosophical context, but I think they should. Like, I, I think they have really high caliber and quality, um, you know, like content, educational content for like entrepreneurs is just that I feel like they, they've never gone the uh, extra mile of putting it in like a formal way. And I think that, you know, the, the, the Deutsch and po like Popperian worldview just fits so nicely within their like starter framework. Just like a random thought on like what Max said, um, about like, you know, talking to users and like, having an internal forum for debating what users tell you and how, like, how do you, how do you account for those, um, like feedback? You can even expand that as well to thinking about what you should work on in your own career, right? Your yeah. own thought about what you should work on personally, right? For you, you think, all right, I should be, I should go into uh, crypto. I should write Solidity. I should build Sablier, right? You have to run through the same kind of, you know, you have a problem. What should I work on, right? You're interested in certain things. You conjecture that, hey, I think I'd like to work on this. You have to be open to criticism and go through cycles on that, right? So this, this is a very broadly applicable worldview that's really helped me in my own life as I've thought through these things. So I think the YC point's great as well. I think I see a lot of parallels there too. Yeah, I agree, actually. You should treat your career as a, as a startup and your, your skills as the product and then, you know, try to find uh, product market fits in that way, I guess, uh, which, which is, you know, just like you, you would do with a, a regular startup, I guess. Yeah, for, for sure. Uh, uh, you know, not only career is uh, error correction, but life in general is error correction, right? Um, so uh, definitely very, very important point. Maybe the last thing, uh, AGI. So yeah, Max, you're, <laughs> you're already laughing. Uh, it's been really hard for me on, on Twitter recently because uh, so I have, before I got into crypto, I was a machine learning guy. So I did that for a couple of years. Uh, and I think if the crypto Twitter people would like, they see how outsiders talk about crypto, that's how, how it feels to me about AGI right now. And so for example, talking about Elon Musk, right? A uh, huge fan of Elon Musk as a builder, right? He built some amazing things and you have to respect that. But his take on AGI is just, you know, it feels like looking into the past where I don't know which physicist said uh, at the beginning of the 20th century, it's like physics is done, right? It's only about decimal points anymore. Uh, Max, I know you have some, uh, some very interesting uh, thoughts about that. Yeah. I mean, um, I think it's, it's weird that it's so contrarian now to believe that, uh, AGI won't kill us all. Uh, I think the problem is that, uh, there's this uh, meme in our society right now that uh, if AGI exists, it's automatically going to kill all humans and it's automatically going to destroy the whole world and nothing positive will come out of it. Um, I, I, I don't think that's fair. Uh, it's a new technology. Uh, you know, nu you could apply that to nuclear, for example. Uh, yeah, you, you can use nuclear energy in the wrong ways and, you know, it, it could turn out really bad. Uh, but... Right. As of now, it has turned out pretty good. Uh, you know, we have electricity all around the world. Uh, it's incredibly powerful. Uh, it's very useful. Uh, we have like nuclear submarines and stuff. 
Um, and you could reason the same about EGI. And so I think it's very naive and wrong to, uh, even already now, actually, but like we don't have the technology yet. It's like I tweeted the other day about it. It's like, it's as if you were criticizing, uh, as if you were saying that all planes will crash before the plane, the first plane ever existed, before you even knew what the plane looked like, because we don't have EGI. And people who think that these uh, LLMs like uh, GPT-4 will turn out uh, as AGIs are, are, are wrong because it's not a computation problem. It's it's kind of like a, a universality problem where you have to, you know, it's a step up. Um, it, it, you don't become conscious just because there's more computation. Like the algorithm won't become a sentience just because there's more computation backing it. Um, and so th th that that's already a, a wrong thing. Uh, and then the other thing is the fact that um, we shouldn't try to predict the future growth of knowledge, uh, which is what boomers are doing. Uh, and the likes of Yudkowsky. I mean, I, I like to joke about the fact that uh, Yudkowsky's philosophy is like uh, degrowth for tech bros. Uh, and I think it's, uh, it's, it's kind of like very true because it's like, you know, oh, uh, let's nuke all the data centers. Let's ban all the GPUs. Let's, you know, go back to... Uh, uh, pre-industrial civilization because, oh, AGI. Uh, well, we, we don't even know how AGI works, what it looks like, uh, and the likelihood is that it could be very useful. Uh, and just like humans, uh, if AGI, turn, like if we're able to create AGI, uh, it, will, it will have feelings, it will have emotions, and I, I, and I don't think it makes sense to, to think that it will automatically turn out wrong, uh, right? Uh, you know, if you look at humans, you obviously have bad people, right? You have dictators, um, uh, you know, like the North Korean dictator, for example. Uh, but then you have also really great people. Um, and the really bad people, at least as of right now, haven't destroyed uh, our civilization yet. Um, and so, uh, you know, you could reason the same way about AGI, that there will probably be good good AGIs, bad AGIs. Uh, and it's not guaranteed at, at all, actually. Uh, I, I, I don't know even how you could make that claim in the first place that the bad AGIs will destroy the world. Uh, that's just, you know, trying to predict the future, which you can't do. Since this is a, a, a podcast about, you know, David Deutsch's philosophy, I, 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 we do have to point out that David has um, an article, an essay about why has uh, AGI not been created yet. And I read it, I listened to it multiple times. Um, it's, 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 it's beautiful. It's very clear, rational. And his, his, his point is, his explanation is that we are missing an explanation. <laughs> um, the, the problem is not bandwidth, memory, RAM, uh, computation, GPUs, you name it. it it's not NVIDIA. The each the problem, what we're, like what we're missing is, um, for building AGIs is uh, uh, like philosophical. We we don't have a full understanding of the universality of the human mind. Uh, if we did, we could write the algorithm for that over a weekend, maybe or maybe a few months. Um, uh, uh, probably the the and this is like my wild speculation here. Um, the um, uh, the first you know version of an AGI will have a couple of maybe tens of thousands of lines of code um and you know i mean all you need is i mean again just a wild speculation but you 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 basically need general meta representations you know you, you need to be able to think about anything as the human mind can um lms like chat they're highly customized for like learning language and like like responding to language queries they're not customized for you know, uh, I think on the like on the recent podcast with um, Team Paris, um, like they're not built for um, uh, for being this like disobedient. ChatGPT will never tell you, you know, hey, hey, man, I, I I don't want to help you. I just want to go play tennis. It's not going to do that. Um, now, with that said, so I'm obviously in the same camp as you guys. I think what I do want to point out is like to, at the end of like my part here is try to briefly still, like still, still man, 
you know, all, all of these, you know, doom, doomsayers position. And I think like what they're saying is that like, this is different from any piece of the, like technology from before, because you are bringing about a new class of intelligence, which is presumably faster than ours in, in, in terms of like being able to make calculations or whatever. And uh, I've, I've seen them point out history and say that, look at what humans did to Neanderthals, right? We, uh, apparently our ancestors, uh, our past explanations say that our ancestors just basically, you know, killed those other, uh, uh, like hominids, um, because they were like faster, like making groups and like, uh, communicating and so forth. Um, and you know, that's what they say, you know, and, and now I want to refute it <laughs> because I, I, I try to like still it and like say it's like new category and so forth. I want to refute it by, by saying that, um, Neanderthals were not, um, universal in, in like the sense humans are. They were not able to communicate at the scale that humans are. We are able to communicate globally. AGS will be able to communicate globally. We are synergistic and we create knowledge, uh, uh in, in, in a way that is comparable with like AGIs. Like the only thing, like the way I like to think about this is that what is the difference between a human with GPT-10 and an AGI? Like you will be able to answer the exact, to like have the exact same knowledge as the AGI has, maybe with like a lag of, uh, you know, five seconds until you type your questions. Fine, but you you will be as good as those AGIs in terms of like what knowledge there is. There will be a lot of knowledge that there will not be, which we will have to create. But that will be like something that AGIs will also want. So why kill knowledge creators when you want knowledge? The the axiom of like I, I think I, I think the axiom of Deutsch and uh, uh, the Deutsch and worldview is that you want to have as many knowledge producers as like possible, um, because you know, the more knowledge producers you have, the, 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 the more problems solve and, you know, like so on and so forth. Um, so that's my position to like sum up, uh, 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 humans and AGIs are on the same rank. We both want the same thing. We both want to save prop like solve problems. And the only issue is how do we, um, integrate them into our society? And, you know, that will be solved with AGI schools and the, exactly as we do with children and that's it yeah and to just come back to your points uh i think there are two things like the this time is different arguments which uh the doomers use is just the same as uh you know we, people use previously for climate change uh, popula uh overpopulation and these types of problems so it's just another uh version of the same arguments but it's no different in reality uh, and then the second thing is that the uh, the solutions brought by um, the, this group of people are wrong. Uh, right, right, I mean, there, there's first the uh, doomsday, completely uh, extremist view, which is uh, you know ban all the GPUs, nuke the data centers, and that kind of worldview, which is nearly, nearly funny. Um, but then you also have the let's align the um, the AGIs, uh, which is wrong too. Uh, you wouldn't you wouldn't align a human. Uh, that's called brainwashing. That's called torture. That's called slavery. Um, that's literally what aligning is. And if you consider an AGI as um, a human, because it's it's a conscious being with feelings and which has universal which is a, a universal mind, um, then aligning it is essentially yeah brainwashing. It's uh, enslaving it, uh, and is just horrible. Um, and it's just not the right way, way of doing things. And if anything, that's actually the proof that GPT-4 or whatever are, isn't not, it's not a version of early AGI or whatever, because, you know, GPT-4, you can align it very, very easily. A human, you, you will have to work a lot to align it, uh, because a human will objectify, will, will not want to obey, will be lazy, will, you know, uh, GPT-4 will always be there to listen to your, your orders and, and, and obey them. Um, so it's just a completely different thing. Uh, AI and AGI are just not not the same. Yeah, just uh, for the audience, Paul and Max just made a really great argument for having kids. 
uh, it's the only entity of uh, it's the only universal explainer. So uh, more kids, more good. Um, guys, we could go on for hours. Uh, this was more than amazing. Uh, one of the most interesting discussions I had for a while, for sure. Uh, so uh, thank you guys a lot. Yeah, that was, that was fun. Um, thanks for having us. And yeah, I mean, just glad to meet like fellow, you know, Deutsch build. Yeah, uh, it's a, such a such a big coincidence, I guess. And that your guys are into money streaming as well. This was just like yeah, f- ten minutes into the call, that. I was like, yeah, oh, <laughs> I didn't even realize that. There you so, go. Awesome, guys. Uh, to summarize, uh, error correction is good. Uh, stopping error correction is evil. Uh, have a lot of kids. Uh, Crypto is going to win uh, because we're doing error correction on a s- unprecedented speed. Uh, so, yeah, thank you guys for tuning in. And second episode, maybe in a couple of months, guys, would be amazing. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.